Welcome to Latino. This episode is really, uh, I suppose, a memorial to George Adler. Um, I've been doing some reading around about about George Adler, and uh, the story is a very interesting one, but also a very sad one. Adler was a, a genius in many ways. He was born in 1821 in Leipzig in Germany, and he died at a very young age, August the 24th, 1868, at the Bloomingdale Asylum in New York. He arrived in America in 1833, and he graduated a valedictorian from New York University in 1844, and in 1846 he was appointed the Professor of Modern Languages and of Latin at New York University. By 1849 he had compiled a dictionary of German and English language, and this publication marked Adler out as one of the great linguists of the 19th century. The dictionary, interestingly, is still in print. Throughout his life Adler suffered from agoraphobia, and he was subject to bouts of uh, severe affliction, which came and went. In October 1849, after he had recovered from a bout of insanity, um, Adler travelled to Europe for a year, and on the ship he met Herman Melville, and this was an encounter of momentous importance, both for for Melville and, uh, to some degree, for Adler. Um, The encounter of Adler and Melville was very intense, Uh, Adler, being agoraphobic, um, spent a lot of time in his cabin. And uh, on board ship, Melville and Adler spent almost the entire trip talking to each other. And from that time onwards until Adler's death, uh, they remained very close friends. And indeed, of the handful, and literally the handful of people uh, that attended Adler's funeral when he died, uh, one of those was... Herman Melville. Regarding Adler, Melville has this to say about him. Um, Following on from this trip, he said, Adler is full of the German metaphysics and discourses of Kant and Swedenborg, etc. And uh, it is here that Adler was the author of a formidable lexicon, German and English, in the compiling of which he almost ruined his health. He was almost crazy, he tells me, for a time. In one of his notes, he says, Walked the deck with the German, Mr. Adler, till a very late hour, talking of fixed fate and free will and foreknowledge and the absolute, and his philosophy is Coleridgean. He accepts the scriptures as divine, and yet he leaves himself free to inquire into nature, and he does not take it that the Bible is absolutely infallible, and that anything proposed in it in science must be wrong, that anything opposed to it in science must be wrong. He believes that there are things out of God and independent of him, things that would have existed were there no God, such as that two and two make four. For it is not that God so decrees mathematically, but that it is the very nature of things, the fact it is thus. Melville was very influenced by Adler's philosophy. Adler had this idea that there was a divine order that was neither transcendent nor was it imminent at the same time. According to Adler, Christian divinity coursed through the material world where it did not, and things pulsated at their own pace. The universal laws of nature, said Adler, would have existed were there no God. Adler's was a common-sense reading of European Romanticism and his way of acknowledging issues of the terror and the sublime so as to diffuse their disruptive potential. The world was infinitely complex, but so too was the mind's eye in its capacity for calculation. Common sense was something that Adler, as well as his adopted countrymen, could get their head around. Certainly everybody is in agreement that Melville's encounter with Adler 
changed him dramatically and the struggles that Melville engages in in his writing subsequent to this were highly influenced by Adler's um, view and his metaphysics. Following his work on the German dictionary, Adler then worked on a grammar of German based on Ollendorf's new method, and this was finally completed in September 1845. It says a lot for Adler that it's now 2007, and both the German textbook on Ollendorf that Adler edited and the German-English dictionary that Adler wrote are still in print, and there are not that many language textbooks for learning a language written in uh, 1845 that uh, are still of current importance but Adler's grammar was so thorough and so lucid that it is still being used. Thus Adler's Ollendorf was completed in 1845 and his grammar of the German and English languages was completed in 1849 so during this period Adler was extremely uh, occupied with his intellectual pursuits. On October the 5th, 1853, George Adler had a violent outbreak of uh, insanity. We're not quite sure what sort it was, but it resulted him in being committed to the Bloomingdale Insane Asylum in um, 1853, two days later, on October the 7th. Adler was committed very much against his will, and he remained a part-time resident of the asylum until his death. On the 25th of August in 1868, Herman Melville was excused from work so he could attend George Adler's funeral. And uh, the funeral was at St. Michael's Church, and he is buried in Trinity Cemetery. Melville was only one of a handful of mourners at the funeral. And uh, when he was earning no money in late 1859, early 1860, before Lizzie had inherited any money, Melville had subscribed for a copy of Adler's translation of a book of Provencal poetry. Incidentally, you can get it on Google Books. A true test of friendship, as, as Melville had no money whatsoever at this time period, and it was a great hardship for him to subscribe to the book. And Adler had translated the book while he was in the Bloomingdale Asylum. Most of the intervening years, Adler had remained confined at Bloomingdale's um, Duykink was there at the funeral is a friend of Melville's riding from St. Michael's with somebody called Dr. Houghton or Houghton who was conducting part of the service and it was a very sad affair a man of great genius living in confinement and dying almost completely unmourned and Duykink uh, Herman Melville's friend rec writes in a letter to his son George he says this, he said Herman Melville, downer with me and two others were at the funeral, and Dr. Tilden Brown of the asylum, in whose face and mien you may read the secret of Adler's regard for him. At least, says uh, Melville's biographer, the staff physician had the decency to be one of the mourners. And that's how Adler's life ended, with a small handful of people attending his funeral. Before I, I end, I want to talk about Adler's Latin Grammar, a, a book that disappeared off the radar completely. While his German grammar is still in print and his uh, German dictionary is still in print, the Latin edition of Ollendorf, which Adler produced, which is as good, if not better, than his German uh, work on Ollendorf, was never used by schools, was never adopted officially, and possibly because of Adler's position in Bloomingdale while he wrote it, um, it never took off the ground. And it's almost impossible to get a, a copy of the book now. Uh, fortunately for us, it has been scanned and you can get it on Google Books. It's an amazing book, a, a truly amazing book, and a work by one of the great philological geniuses of the 19th century. 
1854, in the winter of 1854, Adler was uh, asked to leave New York University, and uh, he found that he had time on his hands. So at Bloomingdale, he used his leisure time to construct the exercises based on his German edition of Ollendorf, but in Latin. He worked on this pretty much flat out for a few months, and as we've seen from um, Adler's life in the past, when he worked, he threw himself into something completely, and uh, then for a while he stopped. In 1856 he recommenced, and... Uh, decided that he was going to go for it and produce a Latin grammar for speaking and writing Latin as though it were a living language. Now this hadn't been done before. Not at all. Now to understand the, the background to this, in the 1820s a um, American uh, teacher called Jean Manesca wrote the first fully developed modern language course which was designed for speaking French and he published a book called The Oral System of Teaching Living Languages illustrated by a practical course of lessons in the French through the medium of English and in the preface to this he gives a very highly detailed discussion of how to go about teaching French as a living language in the classroom situation starting off with a very simple sentence as getting the pupils to speak and the teacher replying, and loads of speaking and replying going backwards and forwards, the teacher introducing new words, but the entire lesson being conducted in French. Now, Ollendorf took Manesca's um, outline and converted it into a system that was far more successful commercially, and Ollendorf's books were all the rage in the 1900s, and... Uh, Despite their expense, they were very large books. I mean, Ollendorf's German grammar, 600 pages of very small print. Um, the grammar, or the Latin grammar, is similar. It's about 700 pages of extremely small print. Uh, if we were to do print that nowadays, we would have several volumes, or certainly two or three, uh, because we wouldn't tolerate such a close density of small text. These books were expensive, and yet they flew off the shelves. Ollendorf adopted the methodology of Manesca. Now, Manesca himself advocated in 1834 that this method should be applied to the dead languages Greek and Latin. However, he said, the, the problem was that there are very few scholars who are competent to actually write a Latin or Greek grammar for spoken Latin or Greek. Manesca held the view that such a grammar would allow somebody to learn Latin or Greek within 12 months. Ollendorf himself thought you could learn French or German from his books within six months. Manesca seems to have had a more or less uh, more realistic um, time frame in mind. But when we think about it nowadays, people learn Latin for years and don't become fluent. Manesca, based on his teaching of French using his method, knew that the method worked, but it was extremely intensive and requires an enormous amount of speaking on the part of the teacher and an enormous amount of vocalizing on the part of the pupil. Thus Adler began in spring 1856 and by 1858 the book was in print. It went through two editions that I know of, but these editions are very rare and it's hard to find a copy. I re-encountered Adler's book um, on Google Books purely by accident and uh, had never heard of it before. In fact, I did various web searches, other searches, and there were no references to it anywhere. Nobody I've spoken to in the classical world um, seems to be aware of its existence at all. And yet this is one of the um, more important 19th century German, I mean, Latin grammars ever published. And... Uh, it's an extremely valuable book, as uh, those people using the podcasts uh, can attest. The system works. Ollendorf's system uh, was extremely um, popular. His books were translated into Latin, French, Germany, 
German, Yiddish, um, Croatian. Um, there are Ollendorfs in uh, Singhalese, in various languages, uh, in just about any language you can think of, um, has a version of Ollendorf's textbook. Um, what happened was that the exercises were simply rendered into other languages, but the exercises remained the same. Um, so you could pick up a French Ollendorf, an Italian Ollendorf, a German Ollendorf, a French to English Ollendorf, an English to French Ollendorf, a German to Russian Ollendorf, a Russian to German Ollendorf. Um, there even exists a French to Latin Ollendorf, which I have a copy of. Um, and so the, the books were extremely popular, and uh, the methodology was then copied by other teachers as well. And most of our modern language methods and teaching methods derive directly from the pioneering work of Maneska and then of Ollendorf, who pretty much uh, lifted Maneska's methodology, um, but reformatted it in a way that makes it much more user-friendly. The Maneska can't really be used by a private learner. It needs a teacher to implement it. Adler wrote his books so that somebody at home could sit down and read them. The other remarkable thing about Adler was that he accented the textbook completely um, from start to finish. And this was something that was unusual at the time and still unusual. And the reason why he did this was that the book is designed to be read out loud. And because of that, it becomes crucially important that the accenting is in place. If you persevere with Adler's grammar and work your way through it, you will end up with a pretty much complete command of Latin. This is what Adler has to say about it. He says that although it was intended that the book should, upon the whole, pursue the course indicated by the methods of modern languages now almost exclusively in vogue, and to make constant repetition and the perpetual construction of connected sentences and phrases from the English into the language to be acquired the chief exercise of the student, Yet I could not make up my mind to surrender system to mere empirical practice to the extent to which this is done by Mr. Ollendorf. My aim was to rather sacrifice nothing of the theory and to leave no point of grammar unexplained or unconnected, but to make the student advance with equal pace from practice to theory and from theory to practice until he makes himself the master and the conscious possessor of the entire structure of a language, as, as far at least as this can be affected by a grammar. I have therefore commenced with the simplest elements and with exercises which a child could even comprehend and learn from with repetition and dictation. As the course advances, the rules of construction become more and more into requisition and the syntax commences, of which I have prefixed connected portions to each lesson to, commit, to be committed either entirely or in part as a student progresses with the exercises and thus I have succeeded in incorporating by degrees a complete syntax of the language to the rules of which perpetual reference is made in subsequent parts of the book and with which the student must become familiar before we can reach the end of the volume. When it comes to how he's dealt with the uh, material in the book, Adler rearranged the chapters of Ollendorf and the um, elements of some of the exercises. And what he did was this. He said... In regard to the etymology, I have naturally treated the declension of substantives, adjectives and pronouns in the very first lessons, and these, with the practice exercises given, will soon be completely in the power of the learner. But the doctrine of the gender of substantives, the declension of Greek nouns, the derivation of adjectives and adver adverbs, etc., which would only have embarrassed and retarded the student in the beginning, are deferred until nearly the very close of the book. With verbs, I have proceeded in a similar manner. I first only give present tense active, and then in another lesson the passive, and then the deponent verbs. A general outline of the formation of tenses follows in lesson 28. And then the student is referred to paradigms of conjugations on page 600 and 6 to 665, 664 to 665, and these can be read and committed to memory as in ordinary grammars. But in the regular order of the book, you learn and apply only one tense at a time, and you practice that until you are fit for another, and so on to the end. Regarding his system of accenting, 
which was extremely punctilious and very accurate. Um, Adler says the following. He says, to ensure correct pronunciation, I give directions at the very beginning for the accentuation of Latin words, and in the examples preceding the exercises, as well as in those given under the principal rules, the use of the accent is practically exhibited. To enable the student to accent according to the rules set forth in the first lesson, the quantity of all the words given in the vocabularies, as well as those of a declined or conjugated, is indicated with almost lexicographical minuteness. Now remember that this is the man who wrote a dictionary, and so when it came to lexicographical minuteness, he knew what he was talking about. In this respect, I have rendered what I think is found in no other grammar of Latin, and I am persuaded that this system, without which we can scarcely conceive of a correct pronunciation, will commend itself to the approbation of all competent to judge upon the subject. At the end of his introduction he says, I submit now the result of my somewhat protracted and by no means trivial labours to the candour and enlightened judgment of the classical scholars of America. As the plan I have pursued, although it aims at nothing short of a radical change in the treat teaching of the language, I scarcely feel as if it needed an apology. The plan of learning a language by writing it and speaking it is not only the surest but the only road to its complete acquisition. Methods analogous to this, though unrecorded, must have been employed by those who have used and to some extent still use Latin as a medium of written communication. And not unfrequently with an elegance which reminds us of the ancients. Of the ancients. At any rate, Adler finished writing his grammar in 1858, um, round about March, April or so, and by August 1859 he was dead. So uh, there wasn't much time for him to promote the book, and as I said, um, it disappeared, as indeed did um, Maneska's book. Maneska's books also are not that easy to find, although it's it's easier, funnily enough, to get a hard copy on the second-hand market of Maneska than it is to find a copy of Adler. And that's pretty much everything that I could find out about George Adler. Um, there must be other material available, um, and I would be interested to, to see it if anybody knows of anything, as uh, he seems to have been quite an interesting man. And on that note, I will bid you farewell, and uh, I hope you get a lot of pleasure from Adler's book, and I'm sure that uh, if he were around to know about it, he would be very pleased to see that all his hard work is finally um, being put to good use.